I'll start it out with um, some quick full transparency. Most of the time when I do talks like this, they're done with the help of about three beers. Um, and it was just way too fucking early to, uh, <laughs> to down three beers. So um, anyway, today we've got a lot to cover, so I'm gonna move quick, uh, try to keep up. Um, it's about transparency in you. Uh, and what does that mean? Um, transparency is fundamentally the way that I've found success in the various careers that I've been a part of. Um, so I tried to come up with some titles for uh, what this would be called. Um, this was the one that I landed on, but these were uh, runners up. If you talk to my wife, she would say that we have a relatively stressful life. Um, I oftentimes get pegged as a designer. I am not a designer. Uh, I've just worked uh, close to designers and I play one on, on TV. So um, don't assume that you're going to see really good stuff today uh, because ultimately I am a pretty horrible uh, designer. But my name is J.B. Salceda. I, uh, most people associate me and my work with uh, the state of Texas and um, cowboy stuff, western things, uh, historical documentation, things like that. Today we're not really going to focus so much on the work. I'm going to tell you some things that very few people know about me, um, some things that are kind of embarrassing. Uh, you'll find out my uh, credit score and a few other things like that because I really do believe in transparency. So um, this isn't really a talk about me and my career. It's like the director's cut of uh, my career where all the shit that didn't make it into the theaters uh, gets shown. Um, so most people, again, like I said, mo uh, most people know me for uh, my personality related to Texas. Very few people uh, who aren't my like really good friends know that I was born in Chicago. Um, full transparency, it's not really Chicago. If that's Chicago, I was born out in Arlington Heights. <laughs> so um, anyway, we were only there for about seven months. It's not my fault. My parents chose where to have me. If it would have been my decision, I would have been born here in this great city. Um, but I wasn't. Arlington Heights is the uh, runner up. Shortly thereafter, at about seven months old, we moved back down to Texas. Um, I can't specifically quote what it was that my father said, uh, because I, though I was there, I couldn't comprehend it. Um, but a uh, second piece of full transparency, it is really hard to draw Texas freehand. Um, I, 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 I challenge you the next time you have a napkin to try to draw it freehand. Uh, I work in the business of Texas and I can't draw it freehand. Um, but anyway, we moved uh, back to Texas when I was about seven months old to the great city of Houston. Uh, if you're not a baseball fan, then the last couple of slides, including this one, have not been making sense. Um, but lived in Houston. If that's Houston, I actually grew up in LaPorte. So um, southeast of, of town, right off of the Gulf Coast, spent my life uh, fishing and it was a uh, you know just middle class neighborhood close to all the chemical refineries. If you drove here in a car full of gasoline, that gasoline came from where I uh, grew up. Um, but anyway, uh, I grew up in, in Laporte, Texas. It was a great middle class lifestyle. Uh, apparently with, uh, you can't really tell in this, but um, it, it was a time before autofocus. Um, so <laughs> the resolution on this screen kind of killed my joke. But, um, but anyway, that's me riding a bike. Uh, this is my mom. Um, that's not her actual Twitter username. If you go look that up, I don't know who you'll find. Um, this is my father um, on the Colbert Report with Ben Franklin. Um, I'm not going to give you context uh, for why this happened because there's just something super entertaining to me about uh, putting this screenshot up there but, and, and really not explaining it. Uh, but that is real um, and it was fucking hilarious. Um, I will say that me, uh, my father uh, helped poke fun at racist assholes uh, really unwittingly. Uh, I found out because my high school teacher was like, holy shit, your dad was the token Mexican guy on the Colbert Report last night. <laughs> um, so uh, again, I won't really go into de the details about it. Uh, if you want to know, I'll send you the video. Um, but my father made the mistake of letting me shoot a photograph for, uh, of him that eventually was sold on Getty Images. Um, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, full transparency, I grew up in the Enron era of Houston. We knew people who worked at Enron or knew people at Enron who lost money through investments at Enron, and that scared the shit out of me. Um, at one point, my father, uh, he wasn't working at Enron, but he worked for a steel company, and when I was going into high school from eighth grade, he came home and said, uh, you know, the management decided to close our office. I'm 45 years old. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find another job here. I think we have to move to Dallas. That was horrifying. You know, I lived this middle class lifestyle. I was all psyched on being able to live in the same house that we had grown up in. And suddenly my whole world was about to be turned upside down. And I realized that the decisions and the motive, motivations of people that are above you that work in different departments and different cities and, you know, drive different cars than you and everything else, 
they affect you. And so at the end of the day, whether you're a freelancer or not, there's no such thing as uh, job security. You know, you may believe in the idea that you have job security, but at any given moment of your career, the people who are paying your paycheck or the clients who are, you know, signing your checks and paying your invoices could up and disappear. So that had a major, major impact on me. I uh, wanted to go to school somewhere really cool. Uh, my dad went to the University of Texas. Uh, he went back to school later on in life uh, when he was about, uh, about my age now um, and graduated from business school at UT. If that's the University of Texas, that's me. I lived over there. Uh, full transparency, I did most of these slides in, uh, over the course of the last couple days and uh, kind of rushed through them. It's part of my like, style. Uh, it's how I edit. Uh, I have to work under pressure. Uh, but anyway, I um, went to the University of Texas. I, from a very young age, as you can tell by the look on my expression or on my face, I didn't really like going to school. I, I, I love school. Let me let me back that up. Full transparency. I love school. I love learning. I am not so good at um, time-based uh, finishing things on time, uh, turning in projects when you're supposed to. Um, so I was. I, I felt like I was the student who, more often than not, the teacher at parent-teacher conference day would say. Man, we're just like really feeling like there's some a little more potential we could squeeze out of this guy. But that was just my working style. And so I went to the University of Texas. I originally thought I was going to study math because my dad told me that there were really solid, uh, employable, um, or a math degree was a very employable degree. So I go to the University of Texas, was super frustrated. I was like, fuck this, I'm going to switch majors. I switched to economics because that was interesting to me. I switched again to government because that was probably the most interesting and I could like write those papers in my sleep. Not that I did, but I did, uh, I could have. Um, but while I was there, I took a course with a guy named Dennis Darling, who, he's a journalism professor at the university, and uh, he teaches journalism for non-journalism majors. So I took a course with him, in a roundabout way, I realized like maybe I'm kind of more cut out for the advertising industry. Didn't really have that full answer or that, that clarity at the time, but that class drove me in the direction of the ad industry. Long story short, Somehow or another, my resume ends up on the table of uh, Marty Butler, who owns, an, uh, with his brother, an uh, agency here in town called the Butler Bros. They uh, called me up and they're like, whoa, shit, you've got a lot of random experience in creative uh, media and all these other things. We're a small shop. We could use an intern like you. Would you be interested in applying? So they called me up. I freaked out. I jumped at the opportunity. And I got put in all kinds of situations. I was sent to, uh, well, where was that? I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest, doesn't matter. Uh, Midwest sucks. Sorry if you're from the Midwest. Um, but anyway, uh, and sorry Creative Mornings uh, audience that's watching from Milwaukee. Uh, uh, yeah, um, or wherever, um, Texas rules. Uh, but anyway, I got sent to somewhere in the Midwest with like the CEO of Fuddruckers. Like I put in all these opportunities that I would not have get, been given in any other circumstances, but they killed it. They set me on the road to becoming a photographer. So. Eventually, I became a photographer, got to photograph some people that you guys may or may not know, being that this is a room full of creative people. Uh, this is the former coach of uh, the University of Texas Longhorn football team. Uh, football is a sport. Sport is a thing that people do physically to compete against one another. Um, so anyway, that's Mac Brown. Um, this I shot for Fast Company. Uh, these are some cowboy friends of mine. This is some uh, lawyer at the UT. Uh, Law school, these are just some random uh, white people for an advertisement. Uh, that's Danny Green from the Spurs. This is a lady that uh, basically helped get the uh, Alamo wrestled away from the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, and now it's in control of the General Land Office, which is awesome. That, uh, that guy is Ed Burns. He was in State Private Ryan. Uh, that's Bevo. Now, anyway, the work's not important. Um, if you want to find it, you can go look up my website, and you can see it and take your time. Um, what's important is, why did I become a photographer? Well, it actually had very little to do with me wanting to be a photographer or knowing at the time that that was the career that I wanted to pursue. It had more to do with the fact that while I was at UT, there's the tower, there's me, classes were over here, and I didn't really go to them that often. I was a really, really shitty student. Um, I was in, interested in learning. I was interested in being there. All of the experiences that came with being at a big university like that were awesome. But at the end of the day, experiences don't make GPAs. So um, by my senior year, I was not doing too well. I was really, really close to graduating, um, but I did not. Full transparency, a lot of my friends and uh, family, this will be the first time, 
most of my family knows this, but and a few of my friends, but most people didn't, didn't realize that I didn't actually graduate. I walked, I was super close to graduation, but I was super frustrated with myself because I was wasting my parents' money on a degree that was not in line with what I wanted to do for a living. And so my parents paid for my uh, tuition. They paid for my room and board. My dad put himself through college and lived on an army cot in my aunt and uncle's living room. I felt like a piece of shit bratty kid. So I made a decision to drop out. Um, well, I got kicked out. It wasn't really my decision. <laughs> it's the universities. Um, but I got kicked out. I had the opportunity to go back. Um, so I became a photographer because it was the way for me to stay in Austin. I, I made a decision to stay in Austin so I could go back at some point in my life and finish that degree. And the way to do that was this skill. I'd pick up a camera, I was good at it, I'm going to be a photographer. I'm not passionate about it. I'm not, you know, I'm good at it, but I'm not passionate about it. If you want to see people who are passionate about it, look at Adam Voorhees, look at Randall Ford. There are friends of mine who are amazing photographers. They deserve all the praise for that. I'm just good at business and I'm good at operating camera and sort of good at Photoshop. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm not good at school. And so um, Donald Trump did not say this about me, but um, <laughs> if, if I was a big player, if I was really like famous on the internet, this probably would be something that he would say. You know, now the, uh, what you can't really see here is the orange line that's going down uh, from the left to the right. Um, this is an actual screenshot of my credit score uh, right after college. I had no prospects. I uh, got to the end of my, my internship with the Butler Bros and I was like, hey guys, um, what's the word? Can I get a job here? And Marty and Adam were really transparent with me. They said, full transparency, you're a jack of all trades but a master of none. We need a really good designer. So thanks for all the help for the year, um, but maybe you should go try to like figure out what's next. And what's next was being broke as shit and uh, taking a credit score that I built and, and established in college and being proud of myself for having good financial responsibility and just throwing that in the trash can. Some months my phone would be disconnected and I'd have to take a credit card and pay my cell phone off and then my lights would get turned off so then I'd have to take what little cash I was making as a freelancer, designer, or web, or I was doing anything. If you had creative endeavors that you needed and it involved a, a, the Adobe suite of software, I was your guy. I it wasn't good, but I could do it. And so I took that little bit of money and I basically sometimes paid my credit card or my uh, cell phone bill and sometimes my electric bill, neither in the same month. Um, and over time, the credit card stopped getting paid. My credit score went to shit because the road to success is pretty lonely. And so as of today, my FICO score is 659. It's not great, it's not horrible, it's not trying to impress anybody, it's right in the meaty part of the bell curve. I'm happy with that now, but it was dog shit about a year ago, two years ago. When we went to buy a house, my wife, she, thank God she had great credit and a actual job. Even though I was like further in my career and doing really well, credit bureaus don't give a shit about that. What you did you know, today or yesterday, they wanna know like, what does the last seven years look like? Well, that's what the last seven years look like. So anyway, um, couldn't get credit for a long time, have always had just a real like scrappy mentality about how to achieve the goals that I have. Um, and so scrappy uh, kind of took uh, shape in the form of an organization called Public School that I co-founded with a group of guys in East Austin in a really shitty warehouse that I was just telling you about, Robin. Um, it was scrappy, it was horrible. It uh, was basically just a big white room with a, it was essentially like a storage closet. You can see the ladder there. Uh, that's Cody Haltom, I think Matt Gentempo. I can't tell who the, who's back ahead that is. Uh, but it was all founded based off of that table in the middle. It looked like a public school table, so we came up with the name. Uh, that was pretty much it. Uh, it was really just a group of guys who were all trying to make it through their careers. Uh, we would do installation pieces like this one on Frank. People complain about parking downtown, so we said, let's help you out. We'll put some more parking down in the Frank parking lot um, and put a uh, Wienermobile parking spot up on the wall, uh, complete with uh, spilled uh, fresh coffee. Uh, what you can't see on that CD is it, it says uh, the Screw, uh, Screw David mix, and it was basically like a breakup CD that we, you know, someone would throw out of their car. Uh, there was like a used condom, some random weeds, uh, all other stuff. We had like a special meal that we were uh, selling, or we weren't selling, uh, Jeff Pivoto was selling at Frank, uh, but we provided like little uh, lunch trays and came up with a menu item for them to sell while our thing was up. But ultimately, through all of the public school experience with, uh, there were a couple photographers, mostly designers, we decided, hey, you know what? There's a lot of stability in agency life. Let's stop being freelancers and try to start an agency. That seems like the much better way to go. 
Well, the crazy thing about the living on the freelance side of things is that you look across over in the other yard and you feel like the grass is greener over there. But ultimately what you realize is that there is stress everywhere. You know, when you're on the freelance side of things, you get to go to things like creative mornings and nobody gives a shit. And you know, it doesn't matter what you do with your time. But at the, on the flip side, you're sitting here, I can see it on the back of uh, most of y'all's necks um, because I can see through you. Uh, the hair on the back of your necks that you're, for all of y'all that are freelancers are super concerned about where your next job's coming. I can, see, I can tell some of y'all, maybe. Um, and then for the, other, the flip side of it, uh, the owners of some of the agencies that are here, uh, like you guys from uh, T, uh, the, what was the name of it? Uh, yes, yeah, so you guys are stressed out about like where's our next client gonna come from? I can see it. And then all the rest of y'all that they're the employees, now y'all are stressed out because you saw my slide explaining how you don't have job security. So everybody in this room is screwed. That fence does not exist. We're all standing on the same goddamn piece of grass. So um, anyway, public school eventually died a slow death of uh, us just like deleting our blog and just deciding like we don't want to do the agency thing. The blog was really what helped us make, get our name out there, but it eventually went away. Um, but despite that, it still exists in the form of the close relationship that all of us have and the sharing of information that all of us have. We office together. We don't collaborate on things quite as much as we used to, but we do still work pretty closely together. We're just not as public about what that is, um, despite our name. Now, my newest career, though, is all about the internet. Um, so we, uh, as Ben was um, explaining, I have a few ventures uh, that are primarily related to the internet. Um, it's essentially this uh, Twitter account and social media account called Texas Humor that is uh, really just satire about living in the state of Texas. Um, if you can't read that, the woman on the right is saying, I love fall in Texas. The man on the left is saying, me too. It's uh, my favorite two or three days of the year. Um, the, uh, you know, so it's really just the creation of memes. If you've ever wondered, like, where do memes come from? Who the fuck's sitting around like creating this stuff? It's us and uh, Allison back there. You can raise your hand, Allison. Um, so we, uh, you know, when, uh, if Donald Trump's out there talking about jobs going overseas, those are two jobs that are staying right here. Um, you know, you can't, you, the Chinese cannot outsource creative uh, humor about the state of Texas. And if they tried, they would ruin it. So um, that's one job that's staying put in America, y'all. Um, so anyway, now the reason I started this whole internet-based uh, business is because the photographer's income is total boom and bust. I might get a call to go shoot a project. I've got a project in a few weeks for uh, Yeti uh, that I'm shooting for McGarry Jesse. Uh, there's a really great budget with it. I'll walk away in one day making uh, great cash. But then, you know, for the next two months, I might not get a call for, uh, about that again. That my business is heavily relying on ad agencies to get their shit together and, you know, like get us the information and the projects that we want and need to pay for our kids to go to school and college and uh, make the same mistakes that we all did. So anyway, um, that's what my income looked like. It was like this, it was great, up and down, whatever. We got married, I started feeling super guilty about the fact that like, I was making great money, but there was no guarantee that I was always gonna stay busy. Photographers have a shelf life. Eventually you want the next like, fast talking, uh, white looking Mexican guy to come like, shoot your ad campaign, and JB Salcedo is no longer cool, and now somebody else is the person that you're gonna hire. So, I saw the writing on the wall, decided I still wanna be a photographer, but I gotta figure out a more stable set of income um, to uh, you know, support my family, buy a house, and somehow like punch through the horrible credit score that I have. So um, at, we make this joke on Texas Humor all the time about how Texans view the world with a lens that basically is always comparing their current situation to Texas. So when you're outside of Texas, it's definitely ain't Texas, and when you're in Texas, it is. So I drew this, put it on a shirt, it went crazy. We uh, sold a shitload of them. We have a store now where we sell products that we perceive as being, you know, nicely designed, high quality, uh, fashion forward. It's basically like a fast fashion uh, brand for uh, young teenagers and like young adults who live in Texas. Um, so most of what we design is this. Uh, our goal is really to try to like supplant all the shitty stuff that you find in gift stores around the state. We want to provide an alternative for that that most people would be proud to wear. Um, so we ship all those things out of um, South Austin. Uh, we're on track to do $1.2 million this year, uh, which is crazy for t-shirts. Um, now, I'm, I'm proud of that. That's, there, that's one half brag. And then it's also like a oh fuck uh, you know, like moment. Um, because $1.2 million is like a lot of t-shirts to ship. It seems really easy. It seems like that's you know, a walk in the park. 
but the hair on the back of my neck is constantly standing up. The guys that are here from my company uh, can attest to that, that I'm always stressed out. Now, as a byproduct of having Texas Humor, started an organization called Salceda Industries. Salceda Industries is our fulfillment and logistics arm of our business. It is the getting the shit to you after you buy the stuff from us. Uh, component of the, the business. Originally, we founded to uh, just take care of our own problems, which started like this. This was the first batch of orders that we had in our home office. These are the first batch of orders that we had. Um, eventually, over the course of three years, we grew into a 10,000 square foot warehouse in South Austin. You know, the, the size of the shipments and the scale of everything changed significantly. Um, to explain it a little bit, our audience is about million, uh, 1 million, uh, 1.1 million, something like that, through our various feeds. So we have a big audience, a lot of really passionate customers that purchase from us. Um, but now we handle uh, the services, you know, I mean, like all of these bins hold our products in there. Uh, we keep track of inventory. We do all the normal things that you would imagine that a warehouse does. Um, but now we have actually 26 clients in addition to Texas Humor. This hat right here, Hallibros, which is a fantastic uh, clothing brand based here in Austin, uh, of a, a group of fantastic people. Um, it's a men's clothing brand. They're one of our clients. They're one of our favorite clients. Uh, they give us all their shit and we ship it out for them. We uh, help deal with the logistical challenges of growing a business like this, shipping things during the holiday season, scaling up and down, all of those things we take care of for our company or for our clients. Our uh, employees walk around our warehouse with bins that look like this. They use barcode based systems to grab what they're supposed to be grabbing and uh, make sure that quality control level is high. So we're basically like a uh, Mexican owned Amazon um, in South Austin that like drinks and loves Texas tornadoes. Um, so, uh, which I think is great. Um, so anyway, this is what, you know, our like warehouse aisles now look like. This is all Hallibros uh, product um, for the fall. Uh, this is kind of like you know an accessories area. You can see some smaller items, some bigger items, whatever. Um, but we have 16 employees, and so this is where I get into the part where I talk about the oh shit, like you know, whatever. And I promise all of this will make sense in a minute. Um, we have 16 employees, and uh, basically, you know, as you scale, the complexity of what you're doing gets really, really difficult. It's not as simple as just like throw bodies at the problem. Um, as you scale, it's easier to miss things financially. I mean, there, there are a lot of problems that come with scaling and having success like this. I'm not coming up here to like tell you guys to all feel bad about me. It's just the full transparency of the fact that uh, success oftentimes comes with a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. Um, so we actually had a, one near-death experience. We almost went out of business. I hired Kevin, uh, Andrew, uh, Rob, Ringo, and Randy were already there. Another guy, uh, RJ, right before the holiday season last year. Promised them you know, great pay, promised them a lot of work, full-time uh, employment, all this stuff. And then three months later, one of our clients goes kaput and leaves me hanging with a $70,000 bill that, of postage that we had taken on for them. And I had to figure out how to scramble that money together. And so um, I didn't want to have to lay anybody off. It was the worst day of my life to find that information out. I went in there, I cried in front of them and told them, it's like getting me choked up thinking about it now. It was the worst day of my life to think that I had given somebody an opportunity for security in their life financially and then to have that rug pulled right out from under them. It was horrible. So this number right here was also horrible. I won't tell you what that is. I'll let you guess for a second. Okay, enough time. That was the interest rate that I paid on a short-term loan to close the financial gap and uh, save our company. It was horrible. It was awful. Because of a lack of a transparency in the way that that company manages their sales process, I'm a smart individual. Uh, you don't get to where I am by being an idiot. I didn't make a shitload of mistakes and happen upon a business like I have, but I was misled. There was not transparency in the way that this business on deck, not that anybody's paying attention, on deck, uh, <laughs> sold me this loan. So um, I took out a loan. I spent 12,000 fucking dollars a month servicing that loan because of the lack of transparency in the way that I was being screwed. So um, thankfully, we've moved off of that. We refinanced. We uh, survived thanks to a fantastic organization that Stu Smith right there is a part of called Able Lending. Um, they are a godsend. They helped us take that loss, roll it into the future, uh, save everybody's jobs. Howler Bros landed as a client like shortly thereafter, saved the company, we expanded. We went from a 3,000 square foot warehouse to a 10,000 within a matter of months. The pendulum swings absolutely so far every single time. And thankfully, on one end it was 64% and on the other end was Stu Smith. So um, anyway, 
Every month we pay $52,000 in payroll, which is a holy shit, a lot of money. Um, you know, so $1.2 million doesn't sound like a lot now, does it, guys? Uh, I got 10 grand in rent. I got uh, about $30,000, $40,000 worth of inventory every month. It's a lot of money. Um, our American Express card on an, uh, any given month outside of the holiday season has about $85,000 that I have to pay at the end of the month. It's not a credit card, it's a charge card. All of our postage goes on that. I gotta make sure that gets paid. They were the ones that were gonna start calling me if I didn't pull together that horrible ass loan to pay off that postage that I was taking on for my clients. But lesson learned, we got through it, uh, whatever. Our average pay for our employees is $18.02. I don't, um, you know, I, I guess the context for this is that most of these jobs are like warehouse jobs. Most of these historically pay minimum wage, 10 bucks an hour. Um, this includes my wife and I, but we don't pay ourselves very much. Uh, relatively speaking to the amount of debt and everything else that I have to like manage on a monthly basis and the work that I put on, uh, I make about 35.57. That's what I make every guy, uh, guys. So I only make double what our employees make, which sounds like a lot, but again, I you know feel like I deserve that at least for dealing with all the stress and taking this stuff on and staying up in the middle of the night thinking about things. Now granted, we are able to take home some money at the end of the year if things go well, but in situations like last year where things did not go well, there was zero money that went into my daughter's college fund. Everybody else got paid. We still paid bonuses at the, at the end of last, season, uh, last year because it wasn't their fault that I made a bad business decision. We made sure to take care of our guys regardless of what those uh, circumstances were. Now. This brings us here, uh, to today. Why did I tell you all of these stories? Um, it's uh, part bragging, I guess. I have a little bit of an ego, maybe. Um, uh, you know, uh, but it's also to try to give um, a little bit of understanding for what I feel like is uh, probably, I'm not a scientist, I'm not uh, Tony Robbins, I, I'm not gonna like sell you the like road to success, I'm just gonna tell you what worked for me. Um, I feel like the basis of the breakdown in most relationships and the reasons that most people don't have certain successes is because uh, they build resentment. They don't know that they're building resentment, but they do. It may be minuscule, like microtransactions of resentment, or it may happen over time. But uh, fundamentally, it is resentment and tiny amounts of them. So, you know, like for example, with my father, a lot of the issues with college and stuff could have been sorted out had we had had a conversation early on about what the pitfalls were and the positives were about having a job like his. Um, if he had maybe told me about some of the things that he had wished he had gotten to do when he was uh, younger or had different opportunities, I could have had better perspective. Um, if I had been more open with him about how I didn't feel like I was the type of person that should sit in an office and do math every day, um, we could have had you know, a, little more, uh, a little more transparency and le less resentment um, overall. My wife and I, uh, she didn't really understand when we first started dating why I worked so damn much. I worked constantly. And I always had, I was moving like fire to fire and trying to you know, constantly put them out. And it was very difficult for her to understand going, when she had an eight to five, why it was that I felt the need to constantly be moving like that. If I had better explained and didn't lie to her about how shitty my finances were in the first few years when we met and just try to like wine and dine her constantly, she would have had a better understanding of why lack of money is like such a stressful thing to me. So now that the gusher is going, I'm like running around with buckets trying to catch as much as I can as opposed to just like coasting along and being content with where we're at. Um, you know, with my clients, as a photographer, when I would get a call from uh, various agencies, you know, like uh, the job that I just bid on with McGarry Jesse, we from the very beginning say, are we the favorite or not? Are you bidding this to two or three other people? And if you are, uh, are we the favorite? If they say yes, then cool, okay, next step. How much do you got? They'll be honest with us. Most of the time, all you gotta do is ask. And when they ask, they get the budget spend that they need. They don't feel resentful about me coming in with some super high number that I just had to pull out of my ass because as a creative, we're just pulling numbers out of thin air to just like <laughs> assign to what we're doing. Like, Jesus Christ, we're not digging ditches. Um, but the, you know, at the end of the day, like, I try to avoid resentment by just throwing it out on the table and just saying, like, what do you got? And if somebody comes to us and says, you know, honestly, we don't really have much money. We're really trying to pull this off, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to sit here and be one of those jackasses with a blog post about like principles in the creative industry. Fuck that. I got to make a uh, make a living. So if I got if I can help you get to where you're going, then we'll get to that same place together. And at the end of the day, when you have another project where you can pay me more, you will. And I have seen that happen. A lot of people talk about how that doesn't work that way, but they're full of shit. I believe believe me. I I've been through it. I, my career was entirely built on that concept of we're all in this together. Let's put all the information on the table and then bid. Um, the same goes for my employees. 
I don't mind showing what I make. I don't mind showing what the average is for everybody else because uh, at the end of the day, we really do talk about the finances with our employees. I explain how much money is going in and out of that business because if I was them, I would totally understand. I'm sitting here making 18 bucks an hour and we're selling how many shirts and we're making how many millions of dollars? That's crazy to me. Why am I only making this much money? But when you give people an understanding of what it is that they're involved with, it's easier for them to understand and uh, you know, at least see, see what the common interests are and why they aren't making this much money or how something works. But if people don't understand the mechanisms in which they are working, it's easy to build resentment. Uh, you know, if you eventually give full transparency, it's easier for us to realize that this is not, you know, essentially a, you know, zero sum game. It's not us, it's not me versus my father. It's not me versus my wife. It's not me versus my clients. And it's not me versus my employees. At the end of the day, we're all working towards a common goal, which is really just happiness. So get as much of that information out in front of the people that you work with. The more information that there, there is available to everybody, the less likely they are to resent you for trying to get a little bigger piece of the pie. But scratch that last portion of what I said and realize that it's not fundamentally about trying to get a bigger piece of the pie, which is you know hold information, don't show my cards. It's about putting the cards out, seeing what we all collectively, collectively have to win and what we have to work with and grow the pie collectively. There is so much goddamn work in this city. I mean, it is insane how much is happening here. It pisses me off when I hear people getting so amped up about competitive natures between you know, different uh, agencies or whatever. The reason we started our fulfillment company is because one blew us off. I, it is my internal like screw them story that we use at the warehouse, but I still hope that they do really well because the more that they do, it, it just, it's energy that all comes along. So really this is the, uh, my uneloquent way of like wrapping everything up and saying, stop trying to compete against one another, we're all on the same page, and uh, fuck Donald Trump. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, cool, thanks guys.